Hello guys, it is Miss Jamie here once again. I am here with the second half of chapter 11. It was a super long chapter, so I decided to split it in two. So I'm sorry for the delay. Um, as you can see, I'm back here with this super cool um, dragon in our makerspace created by the very talented staff here. Not me, but um, I wanted to sit by it today, shake up the location a little bit. So without further ado, I am going to start with the second half of chapter 11. When I wake up, the only light in the room emanates from the recording light on the audio simulator. Aaron is still in the top bunk. His snoring is the only clear indication he's even alive. I try to remember the last time I've slept that soundly. Except, he's not exactly peaceful. He's twitching hard, and if I listen closely between the bouts of snoring, I can hear him begging to the things of his nightmares. No, and don't, and please. I lie there for a moment, trying to figure out what exactly it was that woke me up. I was dreaming again, but this dream didn't start in the cart or in the grocery store at all. This one started in a tunnel. It closed in on me, edging closer and closer to my shoulders and the top of my head until I began to sink. I dropped to the bottom of something deep and dark. So dark I wasn't sure my eyes were even open. And while I don't remember much after that, I do remember the voice that hissed to me from across that deep, dark expanse. I remember the chilling words it whispered to me. Find me. And then I woke up. But it wasn't the voice from my dream that woke me up. It was a sound. But like the voice from my dream, the sound that woke me is long gone. And, it, and in its place is thirst. Between the Serviva bars and the pizza we did eventually sneak downstairs to eat, my mouth is a desert, and as I stare at the bunk above me where Aaron twitches away, I know there's no way I'm going back to sleep until I can get something to drink. Snatching a flashlight from a pile of orphaned electronics on Aaron's floor, I creep down the hall, taking care to avoid as many squeaky floorboards as I can, but Aaron's house is full of them. Maya's door is shut tight, but Mr. and Mrs. Peterson's door stands open a crack, and I can barely make out the rustle of sheets as I sneak by. Just find the kitchen, get a drink, and go back to bed, I tell myself. There's something weird about sneaking around your friend's house when everyone else is asleep. When you're awake, you're a guest, but when the rest of the house sleeps, it's hard not to feel like an intruder. The thought of Mr. Peterson mistaking me for a home intruder is enough to propel me down the stairs, and even though I know I made too much noise, at least I'm past the worst part now, now that I'm downstairs. Except I'm not past the worst part, because suddenly I'm lost. I hold the flashlight up, disbelieving that I could actually have lost my way from the stairs to the kitchen. But I really have. The doorway to the kitchen should be right in front of me, shouldn't it? I walk forward, not believing what the flashlight is showing me. Yet there it is, a wall where there should be a kitchen. I look to my right, but the living room isn't there either. In fact, all that's in front of me is a long hallway. I stop cold, the contents of my anxious thoughts creeping into my waking life. I shake it off, though, and remind myself that I'm just tired and thirsty, and I haven't ever seen this house at night. It's kind of a maze, even in the daytime, so I must have taken a wrong turn somewhere between the upstairs hallway and the stairs leading here. I keep walking, still hopeful that I'll find the kitchen just a little farther ahead. I don't, though. Instead, I find myself surrounded by closed doors, each boasting a slightly different doorknob and keyhole. What? I'm just about to turn around and retrace my steps back up the stairs when I hear a sound I'd hope to never hear again from this house. Ice cream truck music. 
The melody winds up, then down again, then goes silent and repeats the pattern. I step lightly across the floor of the hallway, pressing my ear against each door I pass. Yet none of them seems to hide the source of the sound. Then the music stops. I wait to see if it returns, but all that greets me are the creaks and groans of someone else's home. I've lived in enough houses that belong to other people to not be freaked out by those sounds. Still, there was something about that thud. I stopped cold, straining. I wait to hear it again. I don't have to wait long. Thud. This time closer. This time with a dragging sound that follows. Then another thud. There's no mistaking the sound now. It's footsteps. Footsteps that aren't moving quite right. I swallow, but I can't wet my dry throat. I want to turn around and go back up the stairs, but now I'm not entirely certain the sound was coming from up ahead. The hallway is playing tricks on my ears, and the thudding and dragging sound, and the thudding and dragging now sounds like maybe it's coming from behind me. A groggy Mr. Peterson creeping up behind what he thinks is an intruder. A sleepwalking Aaron fumbling through his house. An actual intruder. None of the possibilities slow my thumping heart. And why didn't I just get some water from the bathroom upstairs? The thudding and dragging speed up and all at once I understand why it's getting louder. It's moving towards me. I turn to open the door behind me, no longer trying to figure out where the sound is coming from. All I can think about is hiding until it passes, but the doorknob won't budge. I try one further down the hall, but it's locked too. The thudding is louder still, and I try another door. Mercifully, this one opens, and I fall through it, closing the door behind me a little too hard. I wince at the sound, then wait to see if the footsteps pass. Suddenly, I don't hear them anymore. I press my ear to the door, but it's the but it's as though there was never any noise in the first place. No music, no footsteps, no creaks or groans in the walls or the pipes. My flashlight is trained to a single spot on the floor, and only now do I realize I'm standing on a well-worn area rug, the kind you find in the sitting room of some rich old lady's house. Like maybe it was nice a long time ago, but now it just looks like it's trying to hide something worse underneath. I swing my flashlight around the room and find it cluttered with so much furniture I can hardly see the walls that frame the space. There are bureaus and bookshelves, glass cases protecting plaques framed in wood and statuettes carved from crystal. I move closer and see Mr. Peterson's name etched into every single one, each praising him for a different accomplishment. One of the glass cases abuts a massive wooden desk that takes up a fourth of the room, and so much paperwork clutters the desk, even the imposing piece of furniture looks like it might buckle under the weight. I train the light on the papers, spreading, spread haphazardly across the surface, trying to make sense of a room that at one time must have served as an office to Mr. Peterson. There are large curled blueprints paper-weighted at their corners, with measurements and precise notations penciled beside each line and curve. Some of the names I recognize from old newspaper articles. The Bell Tower, the Dead Weight, the Dragon's Lair, the most dangerous thrill rides from Mr. Peterson's parks across the world. There are some that I don't recognize. The Inverted Cyclone, the Whip, whose curves and lines cover the entire space of the blueprint. There's one blueprint that isn't done, that doesn't even have a name, but it spirals to the edge of the paper at angles that seem to defy gravity. A smattering of red X's mark areas on the design like some kind of treasure map, only instead of signaling a treasure, the X's have words beside them like Axis 1, Egress 2, and Hatch 3. 
My mind is trying to keep up, but disorientation and fear have given way to exhaustion, and I'm distracted by the need for water and sleep. I'm just about resolved to ask Aaron about the room and the blueprints tomorrow morning when the beam of my flashlight lands on a filing cabinet shoved against the wall beside the desk. It's packed so fully, the drawers are spilling out their contents, with one fat file seemingly dominating the drawer. In thick black marker, the file label reads, Golden Apple Amusement Park. My heartbeat quickens, and I grab for the file without thinking. Common sense should have made me rethink snooping in Mr. Peterson's study, but I seem to have lost common sense as I lost my way in this winding house. I try pulling the file from the drawer, but it's wedged in too tightly. Instead, all I manage to do is dislodge a couple of papers, sending another few fluttering to the floor to join an already growing pile of spilled contents. The first piece of paper is a letter printed on thick stationery with the kind of letterhead that embosses the paper. Here, I'll show you guys a picture of the paper that he finds. There you go. That's what the letter looks like. From the offices of Lynn Gruber and Fonseca. Dear Mr. Peterson, it is with prejudice that we inform you that we are disinclined to pursue charges against you, your business holdings, and any assets thereby affected by said holdings. While we feel a significant portion of the liability of the death of our client's daughter lies in your hands, given the state's court's findings placing sole responsibility on the Golden Apple Corporation, our client has elected not to pursue civil damages finding you criminally responsible in the death of Lucy Yee. While we reserve the right to re-engage in proceedings at a later date, consider this letter official notice that we are discontinuing pursuit of charges against you, one Theodore Masters Peterson. Sincerely, Fonseca. I blink at the letter and translate the legal jargon as best as I can. Their client's daughter was Lucy Yee, it must have been Lucy's parents suing Mr. Peterson for their daughter's death. But the state found the Golden Apple Corporation responsible, not Mr. Peterson, which means Mr. Peterson probably would have been absolved in civil court, too. I picture my parents in the same situation, stone-faced in a courtroom, while some faceless company is named as my killer. I wonder how it feels to hurt that badly to not get an apology, to not be able to look anybody in the eye and say, you're the reason that I don't make jokes anymore, or eat cake, or go to parks, because there are too many kids there who will remind me of the one that I don't have anymore. I wonder how it feels to be robbed like that, again and again. I wonder how it feels to know your dad was the real robber. I accidentally step on the pile of papers I've contributed to the floor. In the shadows of the study, they look like grainy photographs of a forest, a construction site, a group of people crowded around a work table. But when I pick them up and lay them across the desk, the beam from my flashlight reveals something unexpected. The first picture is a photocopy of a newspaper article. Ground breaks on hometown landmark. Construction begins on a buzzed about Golden Apple Amusement Park. Below the headline is a thick grove of trees, a bulldozer, and a team of workers with chainsaws ready to clear the land. Mr. Peterson is in the foreground, construction hat high on his head, mustache curled to match his smile. But in the background, nearly out of frame, is a stooped figure lurking by one of the trees. I likely wouldn't have noticed him at all if not for the red ink circling his figure, the pen retracing the circle so many times the page is torn. I might not have noticed it at all, but now that I do, there's no mistaking who it is. Blurry and marred in red ink, it's Aaron. He's younger, five years younger if it's at the start of the construction. 
But it's Aaron, and while he's blurry, it's hard to deny that his pose implies that he's hiding. I push the page aside and find another photocopy of an article. Ahead of schedule, pressure mounts for Golden Apple Amusement Park to open by summer. In this picture, Mr. Peterson points to a crane swinging a beam across a framework of what was to become the base of the funhouse, judging by the gaping mouth surrounding the beginnings of a track. All eyes are on Mr. Peterson in the picture, including the crouched boy, circled in red, peeking out from the funhouse framing. The next article is dominated by an entire crew of men in vests and hard hats staring upward at a structure so tall it doesn't fit in the frame, which makes it more noticeable that one hair that one head stares straight ahead. Or rather at Mr. Peterson standing at the front of the group. Aaron is once again encircled in red ink, hanging back by a pile of iron rods. Here they have an illustration of all the of all the pictures. Looks pretty creepy honestly. I'll be a little closer. Super weird. What was Aaron doing hiding like that? At all of the all of those pictures, Aaron is in the background. Super weird. <clears throat> Page after page shows Aaron nearly out of frame, ousted from his hiding place by the red pen's wielder. I look around at the rest of the office, its hulking furniture casting distorted shadows across the framed pictures of the Peterson family. It strikes me that this is the only room in the entire house where I've seen any family photos at all. But when I examine the pictures closer, I see that they also been marred by red ink. The placid, smiling faces of Mr. Peterson, I'm sorry, the placid, smiling faces of Mrs. Peterson and Maya grace most of the pictures, as does Mr. Peterson's. The only unsmiling face is Aaron. And as the Peterson family ages, their smiles turn from placid to pinched and Aaron's face disappears altogether behind the scribble of the angry red pen. Only one picture offers more than a scribble. What appears to be the last family portrait taken of the Petersons, judging by their ages. Beside the etched away face of Aaron is what I first read as his name. But when I look closer, I see that the word isn't Aaron. It's Omen. I drop the flashlight and the room goes black. I stand in place, trembling on a squeaky floorboard it's too late to avoid. Then, from somewhere in the dark, I hear the slow creak of a door swinging open. I was so engrossed in the pictures, I didn't even hear the footsteps return. The thump, the drag, the labored movement of whatever has emerged into the room is so close I can hear it breathing. I know it isn't mine. Run. Run! But my stupid feet are stuck. I want to be dreaming. Please let me be dreaming. But I'm not. I know I'm not. The breathing grows louder, like an animal preparing to pounce. I hold perfectly still, my only defense in the pitch black of the room. But whoever is here knows that I'm here. Floorboards moan under the weight of feet that methodically make their way toward me. They step to the glass case, rattling the awards on the shelves. They step to the desk, with its papers exposed to my prying eyes. They step to the filing cabinet its paper is still protruding from the door. They step so close to me 
that I can feel that hot, menacing breath on the back of my neck. In its exhale, I hear my name. Nicholas, the voice says, you shouldn't be here. A soft glow illuminates the floor and the flashlight at my feet, looming over me as an impossibly long shadow. I turn because I don't know what else to do. I can't run. I can't hide. All I can do is face the shadow. Heat hits my face and temporarily blinds me, and when my eyesight returns, the first thing I make out is Argyle. I tilt my head to the reach the top of Mr. Peterson's face, and I don't like what I see. His eyes, darkened and distorted by the flame of the candle he holds, are barely visible. Below his eyes are the flaring nostrils of a man whose house I should not be wandering without permission, whose private office I should absolutely not be rummaging through. His thick mustache curls upward mockingly, belying the frown that's only barely visible underneath. I look down at my bare feet, terrified and embarrassed, which is the only reason I notice that Mr. Peterson's shoes are on. In the middle of the night, I look up again, taking in his pants and his argyle sweater. I'm in my pajamas, but Mr. Peterson is fully clothed. I struggle for answers to questions I think he might ask, but he doesn't ask anything. In fact, he hasn't said another word since I turned to face him. He's just staring. I watch the light from his candle flicker and sway in the draft of the house, but Mr. Peterson holds it perfectly still. That's how I notice his hands, smeared and coated in something thick and dark. My eyes travel upward, but... My eyes travel upward and I don't know if I'm expecting an explanation for why he's here, what's on his hands, why he's up so late, or if he's expecting an explanation from me. But what I'm not expecting is that smile. That horrible, out of place, unhappy smile that suddenly crept out from under his mustache and spread across his face. Then he starts to laugh. It's a low rumble from his gut at first, but soon it travels through his chest and his throat and out of his mouth, and the light, airy giggle is so vastly different from the growl it started as. I am all, I am all at once aware of how much the room he takes up. His shoulders are broad enough to equal twice my width. I can barely see the doorway behind him and all I want is that doorway. Then, as suddenly as his horrifying laughter started, it stops, and he holds the silence between us with a grasp as tight as that of his on the candle. He leans down, inches from my face, and meets my eyes. Nighty night, Nikki. He says, and with a single puff, he blows out the candle and steps aside. I sprint out of the room and find the stairs. Running on, my, running on feet, I can't even feel anymore. I run past the hallway I was so desperate to traverse quietly moments ago. In Aaron's room, I swing the door shut behind me, locking it against what lurks in the darkness. I look to the top bunk where Aaron sleeps certain the commotion woke him, but he doesn't even snore anymore. He lies still, his face obscured by the comforter, and I wait for a second to see if he's actually awake behind there. When only silence greets me, I'm left with the sound in my heart pounding away in my ears, my teeth chattering in violent rhythm as I fight to calm myself. Then, once I'm finally still, I prop my pillow against the wall and watch the door from the bottom bunk, flinching every time the wood of the old house pops or settles. I've forgotten the drawer full of possibilities. I've forgotten the water that I never drank. I've forgotten the excitement I had about finally making a friend as strange as me. 
All I remember is the music in the basement. Photo after photo of Aaron's circled image. The grime on Mr. Peterson's hands. And that mad, mad smile that grew from a face that's forgotten joy. Wow. Well, that was quite a chapter. Still super long, even though I cut it in half. I don't even know what to say about it. That was super creepy. First of all, how did Nikki even end up in that stupid basement? Like, first of all, obviously you should have realized that you were not in the kitchen. That is what I have to say about that. But once he was down there, I mean, it's super weird how Aaron's face was all circled. Like, it's obviously something going on with that. And, amusement park like he was there all the time and he has this weird guilt then Mr. Peterson being like totally dressed with shoes on and everything in the middle of the night looking all weird weird stuff on his hands I don't even know well that was quite a chapter so that's it for chapter 11 today um, the dragon certainly enjoyed my, the reading. I hope you enjoyed it as well. Um, we're like almost done with the book, honestly. We have a couple chapters left, so if you follow this and you like it, leave me a comment if you have any ideas about what book I want to do next. Um, I have a few ideas, but I want to listen to you guys too. So go ahead and comment if you like. Otherwise, tune in soon for chapter 12. And... Have a great Saturday. Okay, bye.